So welcome along, everybody. Um, great to be um, part of another uh, National Men's Lived Experience of Suicide Network. Uh, we've got uh, a brilliant guest with us tonight, Brendan, who's joining us uh, from Tassie. And so we're going to launch straight in. We've we've um, done all of our uh, pre-session business around welcoming and acknowledging country and also uh, just giving everybody the heads up that, you know, we're going to be talking about suicide. So please look after yourself in this session. Uh, reach out. Obviously, this will be a recording, so you won't be able to talk to us directly, but you probably know where to find us. Give us a call. Um, we'd love to uh, love to connect. So, yeah, for the moment, I really like, I'm sorry, Bren, Brendan, your last name's completely escaped me in this moment, which is pathetic. Um, the two first names, Brendan Barry. Brendan yeah. Barry, that's right. So Brendan Barry, who's, um, yeah, I met through uh, starting, uh, uh, doing a, a mental health first aid train the trainer course. And um, we connected a little bit at that time. And I know Brendan's gone on to do a variety of roles and has a, a really interesting background as a veteran and also working these days with the Department of Emergency Management here in Tassie. Um, so, yeah, I might just hand over to you, Brendan, to tell us a little bit about yourself and how you come into this sort of space. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I When we talk about... Uh, lived experience of uh, mental ill health uh, and a lived experience of uh, suicide. Um, my passion is in around uh, the lived experience workforce. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to that. So to give you some yeah, background uh, about me, uh, as JB said, um, I'm from uh, Tassie. I was brought up uh, yeah, in and around, uh, well, right across the state. I'm the son of, son of a copper. Uh, so I lived in a few police houses and and uh, uh, out the back of uh, well in the southern Midlands and northwest Tasmania and and then down in the south. Um, I've always had an interest in and around mental uh, illness and mental ill health, and it was more probably around uh, you know what makes people tick. Um, I've always enjoyed watching people um, uh, and uh, getting to uh, you know the getting to the back of um, or, or the why of why people do what they do. Um, I was brought up in a very, if you like, political household uh, in and around the union movement. Uh, there was always, we spoke about the all the, the things that you're not supposed to talk about, politics, uh, religion. Um, that was just the mainstay of the house. Um, so with that, I, uh, I always say that I was basically, I think I come out of mum with an opinion um, and my fist uh, kind of waving. Um, and if not, I quickly inherited it from uh, every one of my family members. Um, so I had an interest in mental mental Ill, illness and ill health. Again, it was probably that insight that I got uh, living in small towns uh, with my father and 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 my family, uh, and seeing the you know excessive use of alcohol, uh, especially uh, in blokes uh, and country blokes, um, and again the why that they used it. You know, if there was sadness in and around the town you turn to grog if there was happiness around the town you have a few beers you know if there was something to celebrate you'd have a few beers uh you know and if there was something to you know rightly kind of whinge about and uh and get militant about you'd, you'd have a few beers you know to uh, a bit of dutch courage to to work your way up to that as well um and that probably led me i was quite I say fortunate um, in high school, I actually did my work experience um, at the Royal Derwent uh, Hospital, uh, which was the large psych hospital. Probably before that, you'd call that, and it was the asylum. Uh, it was, it's actually down the road here. I now live in the Derwent Valley in Tassie. And again, there, that's where I was introduced to, you know, quite chronic mental illness um, and serious mental illness, where there was diagnosis of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders and that type of thing. Uh, and it was to the point where those work experience kind of weeks only go for, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of times a year. Uh, but then found myself following my auntie and uncle who were both psychiatric nurses uh, there on school holidays and, and that type of thing. And again, it wasn't, uh, you know, and I'm quite passionate about now in a couple of other roles, it wasn't, uh, you know, to look at fish in a tank and to tap the glass. Again, it was to get to 
uh, the understanding of you know of the why, and also knowing that whilst the staff were doing their best, uh, you know, I was always greeted with um, not so much fascination, but but gratitude. Uh, and no matter where people were at on that uh, mental health or, or mental illness kind of scale of unwellness, um, that human connection is is what people wanted. Um, so from there, um, it was in year 12 where, and I still don't know how they ever allowed a 17-year-old uh, kid uh, in, but I actually then did my work experience at Risdon Prison Hospital. Um, so I spent a few weeks uh, in there with people who, yeah, you know, had done some horrific crimes, uh, but were then yeah, found, you know, uh, uh, but then were, were ill or found not guilty uh, because of a mental illness and that type of thing as well. Uh, it was great. Uh, for, again, a young kid from the bush where, you know, marijuana was growing in every second garage. Um, and as much as we can argue about it and debate it now, there, there was one fella in particular there who was diagnosed with marijuana-induced schizophrenia. Uh, and what he'd done, uh, that was enough for me to leave pot alone. Um, so, so uh, you know, again, what I... And it was instilled into me by my uh, father as well, uh, at a young age, and now I, I think I've since read it uh, in different books. Stephen Covey, uh, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and others have said it, as, is that people aren't their behaviour. And I think when we talk about mental illness, uh, when we talk about you know that that pointy end where uh, whether it's aggression, whether it's self harm, that type of thing, we as a society, um, as you know, as a parent, um, all those type of things, we we can really quickly use language uh, and fall into the trap of judging uh, the human uh, rather than the behaviour and we don't separate it. Um, so again, that was my yeah, introduction, if you like, into the into the mental health kind of space. Uh, with that, Tassie being Tassie, I looked around for work and uh, thought about policing and thought about psych nursing and all that type of thing. And uh, for whatever reason, I drove to Anglesey Barracks one day in a company car and uh, then joined the army for a few years. Still don't know why. I <laughs> don't know what it was in me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, joined and did the fun stuff for a while, drove tanks, uh, battle tanks, uh, and uh, had a had a ball. And then after a, a physical injury, uh, I then uh, core transferred to become uh, a medic. Uh, again, it was there that I had that interest in the how, the why, people think um, and yeah very quickly uh, not so much specialized uh, but had a real keen interest in uh, assisting those uh, with yeah middle illness um, and also uh, then actually back then uh, I actually started a diploma of counseling uh, there back then as well just due to that uh, interest um, it was there uh, where uh, a couple of uh, incidents happened, or, or one in particular, where um, I was uh, yeah, assaulted uh, by a patient. Uh, I was also had, was doing some work with Queensland Ambulance as well. Uh, and it got to the period where I, I used the term prolonged assault. Um, and subsequent to that, I was uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I uh, got out uh, of defence and, and cut away uh, working with with ambulance uh, and after living in Toowoomba for a bit uh, decided uh, with yeah decided to move home um, it was there working on the west coast of Tassie uh, and that type of thing where and I'd always been in and around again uh, you know being a, a big bloke I think I had the the, the nickname long neck by the time I was about 16 because of how much I'd, I'd drink and then uh, and then I think it was keg when I was in the army that was probably due more to my size than how much I drank as well, but uh, they've always been in and around it. Um, and after moving back to Tassie, I, I, I met my partner, uh, Alison, and then uh, had a couple of kids, uh, Callan, who's now 12, and Belle, who's now 11. And um, there was a period, it was about eight years ago now, so the kids were only small, when, um, when I just had a period of unwellness. Uh, that's what I put it down to. Um, and it was really quick for everybody. They blamed the PTSD. Uh, and I did too. Uh, I, I, I say now that uh, I walked in to the doctor's surgery 
the psychiatrist with kind of three things uh, or three or four things. One was difficulty sleeping. One was, you know, using alcohol, you know, to excess. And I knew that I was using it, you know, for you know, a bit more than I, I used to. Uh, one was uh, agitation uh, and leading to aggression. But I always kind of had that ability, um, as, as had that, I say ability, but, but had that as my go-to. Uh, and the others was, uh, yeah, nightmares. So I walked into the doctor with four things. Uh, I then walked out with this thing called PTSD. And I've got to say, it was great. I got to blame everything that was going bad in life, all the behaviour uh, that I was doing on this thing called PTSD. Didn't have to take responsibility for it. I had the, if you like, the 60-minute story of, of what happened to me. So, you know, my my uh, my partner, my mother-in-law, doctors, mates, all the rest, um, you know, in, in different ways, we go, oh, that's not Brennan, that's his PTSD. And what that allowed was horribly a get-out-of-jail card for too long. Um, it was then I had a period, uh, then there was a couple of key moments uh, where I knew that I had to get better. One, I was very fortunate to have, having been in the army uh, to have uh, access to free mental health care, um, or and that was through open arms at the time, uh, Veterans Counselling Service. Uh, and they sent me along to a, a couple's kind of retreat uh, and down here in Tassie, we've got a, uh, a an organisation called uh, Family and Friends, or oh, JB, you might be able to fix this one, uh, TAS Family and Friends. Mental just, Health just, Families and Friends? Mental Health, yeah. So it's, they've just changed their name now. And uh, the CEO, I remember a few years ago, she said the most important thing that we should be we should be doing is getting, uh, you know, when people go to their psychiatrist or go to their psychologist, is getting you know, uh, some support in the room. When we talk about that, some support, their partner being the first, if they haven't got a partner, you know, a brother or a sister or a mother, whoever is closest to that person, just so uh, one, you know, that when you leave, you've got that bit of an accountability partner. And importantly as well, that, that other person can then maybe be a little bit more truthful to the treating providers as well about what's going on. Um, so it was there at that open arms uh, clinic where for the first time I actually saw the impact of my behaviour uh, on my better half. And that was when we were sitting in a circle and she uh, opened up. She's quite a fantastically proud, um, you know, person who, uh, you know, well, she saved me, her and her backbone of steel uh, saved me. Uh, but it was uh, when I saw a tear on her cheek um, that was caused by my yeah, behaviour. Um, and what some of that behaviour, what that was, was a sheriff actually knocking on the door telling us that we had to get out of the house uh, because I hadn't paid the mortgage because my excess use of alcohol and, and other, um, you know, gambling too much and that type of thing had led me to not pay the mortgage. So they were the two kind of instigators. And the third one was my son was about three or four at the time and he was out in the backyard uh, kicking a footy and um, he asked me to go out. And I was halfway through watching Black Hawk Down for probably the fourth time in a week, uh, you know, with a, a carton of cider, you know, beside me so I didn't have to go to the fridge. Um, and I just thought, God, what, what am I doing here? I want a kid since I was, you know, 13 or 14. I've now got one. Uh, and what's more important to me is, you know, getting 5% alcohol stubby down my guts and watching, um, you know, Black Hawk Down yet again. So from there, um, now, I had been in this time meeting with psychiatrists uh, predominantly, was, didn't, wasn't really worried, wasn't seeing counsellors, wasn't really seeing psychologists, anything like that, but had a psychiatrist. And I have to say, um, yeah, it was very poor. I was over-medicated. Uh, consequent psychiatrists agreed um, to the point where a, a complaint was made. Uh, and it was then that Alison uh, organised uh, with a couple of other treating providers to get me into uh, an inpatient facility in, in Melbourne. So that was Ward 17 uh, there where they specialise in, you know, with police and, and veterans and first responders. And it was there what, for the first time where uh, the PTSD, if you like, was stripped away. Uh, there was a fantastic doctor there, Susie Redston, uh, and she knew me from when I was in, and she said, uh, Brendan, what have you done to yourself? Now, 
I then went to the assault that happened, the psychiatrist, all the medication, that type of thing. She said, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no. I knew you when you were a medic. And she looked at all my medication. She said, you're the one who's put all that in there. And then she talked about the alcohol. You're the one who's put all that in there. That was the first time where I was, if you like, told that it was me, not this thing called PTSD. So swings and roundabouts, it all seemed to happen so quick. Um, from there, I found an organisation called Trojans Trek, uh, which I'm now on the board of, uh, and I'll talk more to that. Uh, and it was also then that I was linked in with uh, a fantastic psychiatrist, John Lane, um, who spe again specialises in the veteran and police and first responder uh, kind of cohort. Um, and, you know, no longer did I have excuses. It was there that I realised that you know, I'd gone for a few years of being well, uh, but for me, what it never was was the blood, the assault, the you know what I'd gone through. I worked out what it was was the idea of loss of identity. I drank the Kool Aid when I was in. I drank the Kool Aid when I was a kid. I was always going to either be a copper, you know, and then when I joined assault, wanted to be a soldier. That's what I wanted to do. I had that sense of purpose. The pride that comes along with wearing a uniform. What could and I was now working in HR and other roles, and I probably and I definitely didn't ever do a hundred percent in those roles because I always looked at it and thought, you know, this does not measure up to what I've what I used to do. So for me, it was loss of identity. The other thing for me was that there was a period during that assault where I acted outside of my value set. When I say that, and where I found that from was a, another fantastic psychologist, uh, a fantastic psych psychologist, Kylie, um, who uh, sadly since uh, passed away, uh, where she looked at me and she said, Brendan, if you're not going to listen to me, if you've got that big a chip on your shoulder, and she grabbed a textbook off the wall, I won't swear, but she said, then fix yourself. Uh, and with that, she said, read it uh, and come and see me back in a fortnight. So that's how that was my stepping stone. Uh, to getting better. Uh, what the, the power of lived experience shone, shone through from that moment in Ward 17 right through to what I do now. I actually had clinicians who opened up to me about their struggles. You know, they didn't tell me holus bolus. I was never questioning, you know, their sanity, if you like. But they, that was the difference as opposed to sitting you know, on the other side of a mahogany desk with someone with a prescription pad out ready to write the drug down within six minutes so you're out the door and the next DVA client and the DVA dollars, you know, start again. That was the key for me, lived experience. Mm. Um, from there, again, uh, so I went, yeah, as I said, on Trojan's Trek and it was then where I was introduced to uh, through John Lane, another program uh, which he put together, which was all in and around emotional awareness and relationship skills building. So what we were talking about there was, you know, all this PTSD stuff's great and all these medications great, but you've got to treat medication like a crutch. If you don't want to be on the crutch for, crutches for life, then you've got to do the physio and the work and the exercise to get off it. So for me, again, that was let's... Get smarter. Let's be able to start labeling emotions correctly. Yeah. Let's uh, let's actually notice what you know emotions actually physically feel like, and let's be able to differentiate importantly between what jealousy feels like to to anger feels like, or what feeling uh, you know what actually feeling you know disgruntled or uh, you know dismissed feels like. If you can label them correctly then the default isn't anger or aggression. So from there, um, bang, 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 I was then uh, working for Mates for Mates, uh, and I didn't do that uh, yeah, for too long. I, I worked out that the veteran space, um, you know, day in, day out wasn't for me. Uh, I'll be completely honest. I, I got to a point where I asked the same question that John Lane asked me, and I asked every client, what are you after, treatment, recognition or compensation? Um, because they're three very different things. All three are very important. Um, but, you know, how much time we waste with, uh, you know, in 
the sphere of Department of Veteran Affairs or even the workers' comp sphere where people don't actually want the treatment or they might not be ready for the treatment right now, but we keep pushing them either towards it or they keep on the wheel for fear of losing compensation. We need to get better at that. Um, the other thing is, yeah, is recognition as well. I mean, the Vietnam vets, they are the ones who fought for, you know, recognition for what they've done, taking it away from the, from the military and police and first responder kind of thing. What we need to do is sit down with people, especially if they've got that lived experience of trauma, and actually recognise that that's what it is and have that discussion, that what they've gone through is significant. You know, give them, uh, you know, empower them, you know, to talk about it, to write a book about it, to write an essay about it. Um, you know, but the biggest thing is to just recognise where they've been, what they've done, and maybe what they can't do any longer, but then again, how do we bring them up where they can get that sense of purpose back? Mm. So from there, uh, I worked with a fantastic fella, uh, Klaus, uh, at uh, Flourish, uh, Tasmania, who and they've just uh, recently uh, changed their name as well, who are a lived experience uh, advocacy group. Uh, Klaus uh, was very passionate about bringing the lived experience workforce into the clinical setting. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, for me, uh, you know, every every psych practice, uh, definitely every hospital should have a lived experience workforce where conversations can be had with somebody who's lived through it, been through it. When I, I then moved to open arms in a lived experience role, the new community and peer advisor roles there, and it was Phenomenal. When we got it right and we had a really good and we had a clinician who drank the Kool-Aid lived experience, uh, what that then allowed them to do was the clinician to go, hey, this isn't a chat for me to the client. This is a Brendan chat. Let's us do this work and then I'll, and I'll link you in with Brendan straight after this. You know, um, There's a power to lived experience. It normalises it. It destigmatizes it. We've got to get better at it. Brilliant. Uh, well, I, I want to come to... A couple of a shifts and some transition points that you've sort of been through. Yeah, you spoke about arriving arriving with the the four things: so the sleep, the alcohol, the agitation, the nightmares, and then progressing to a state of having PTSD, then accountability, and then I look at the shift you have now to like a person who's got a passion to help people be well, lead well, and empowering people to succeed in their personal professional lives. When it comes to empowering people, what I want to talk about is what role does identity play in the well-being of people? Because because a lot of what you spoke about was shifts in your identity. So how does that how does that work when you're working with people like to shift their identity and empower like change their well-being? Yeah, I I I really like the uh, and I know there's different debates about it and. You know, my, as I said, not a psychologist. So, but I, what I do do is take away psych concepts and then plain speak. I really like the PERMA model. I don't know whether I use it correctly, but when we talk about the PERMA model, where do you find positive, uh, positive emotions, sense of engagement, you know, where you lose time, what relationships do you have, meaning, where do you find meaning and purpose, and where do you find achievement? For me, identity, let's look at where. Where can you find achievement in life? Where can you find that sense of purpose? Yeah. And I think that's the key then with identity is that you walk out of a building, you know, and when somebody asks you, you know, who you are or what you do, you've got something to tell them. Um, and that, you know, and again, you spend the time in thinking about, you know, why you do it uh, as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You, you spoke like it was an easy transition for you to go, well, it, it kind of it seemed really fluid, like from PTSD to, to having that moment on the couch where you're watching your son, you've got a box of cider and all of a sudden you're like, I want to make some change. And that, that in, in that sentence when you described it, there was a big change in your identity. But what was the journey actually like to really shift? Because it, you sort of flushed over it. I'm like, that sounded like a really, really big moment in your life. So what was that journey like from going, okay, I'm going to do this to actually doing it? Uh, for want of another word, it was ratchet. It was hard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, and my better half would probably be able to uh, explain it a whole lot uh, better than me. Um, it was, yeah, no, it wasn't great. Um, so that, I mean, even just that inpatient setting at uh, – at Ward 17 initially, getting off this ridiculous amount of Seroquel that I was on, 
um, you know, and working out, hey, what's the PTSD and what's the side effects of the medication, you know, suicidality. Is it the PTSD, a loss of identity, or is it a side effect of, you know, the antipsychotics or the prestige or the lithium and, you know, all of that stuff that you're on, you know, and and to Susie's credit, that's what she kind of said, let's cut all this away and work out what the PTSD is. But then, you know, the, the work, again, is, put, is putting yourself out there, you know, like I, I joined... Uh, I'd become a volunteer with TAS Fire Service. You know, some people do it for the lights and sirens to go to fires. I absolutely did it to to find mates. Uh, you know, the two dollar fifty stubbies and playing cards on a Monday night worked as well. But you know, but it was still you know kind of putting your putting yourself out there. Um, but it was hard. You know, like I I had really significant withdrawals from the medication, um, and you know this stuff works. You know, I, I heard. A psychologist once said it to me, you know, alcohol is the best dr dr drug for critical incident stress, for anxiety and for PTSD. And she just left it. She said, that's the best drug. And I was like, oh, that, that's a, that, you know, that's a good, that's, that's straight to the pub for me. And then after a silence, she said that would be if we could take what worked and put it in a real little capsule and got rid of all the side effects. Mm -hmm. Um you know, she said, those side effects far outweigh the positive effect. And mm -hmm. for me, yeah, that that was hard as well. Just just understanding, yeah, the why, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. It does. You, you also touched on another point around your journey around like emotional awareness and what like the yeah. emotional ability and getting in touch with, with your emotions and acknowledging them and reflecting on them. How did that impact like positive or negatively on like your own, like your lived experience of suicide, like thoughts of suicide and your mental health. What sort of role did that have in shifting that? Yeah. Um, and again, you know, I, I say this, this worked for me and it, and it doesn't work for everyone, but I, I went straight, like I, as soon as I saw this really easy kind of visual form, again, John Lane introduced me to it, which was a, and I mean, he's a psychiatrist, but then he's, uh, you know, a lot of the, the course that which was a 12 week long course two and a half hours a week for 12 weeks and you had significant chapter in between each week to kind of read and all these worksheets but it was a really basic worksheet that said here's the event here's the thought and then here's the feeling that seems really simple but when you ask people you know what comes first a feeling or a thought a lot of people are oh, feeling straight away that's like no no it's, it's, it's actually scientifically incorrect. You know, you, you might not recognise that you've had a thought, you know, whatever part of the brain, you know, has has pulled something out of the filing cabinet to give you that feeling, whether whether that then leads to fight, flight, freeze, or, you know, happiness and joy and all that. But slowing that down, especially if we have that kind of hypervigilance. And and John, uh, J.B. said we, we met on the Mental Health First Aid Facilitator course and, Again, I have different thoughts in and around that work that workshop. But one thing that resonated with me was duration, intensity, and impact of symptoms and signs and symptoms. Now, when we talk about suicide, yep, some people gradually, you know, get there. They decide, you know, that they think about it, they think about it, and they think about it. The people who I've come across as an army medic working with Queensland Ambulance, now working with, you know, Department of Police, Fire and Emergency Management, you know, mates in the country and all that type of thing. Whilst there might be a thought there in the back of their head, there'll be something, something that triggers then automatically, then really quickly, they're at that intense kind of, you know, that emotion is so intense and the impact is going to be horrible, you know, uh, you know, if they die by suicide. So it's slowing that down and lowering that intensity. That takes practice. And for me, it was a visual aid, which was just this worksheet and, a, and a, I still visualise it now like a thermometer the old kind of suds kind of thing of am I that far in the red, um, you know, or and what do I need to do to just lower this down just that little bit? Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, the whole, you know, visual around a thermometer. Um, those, you know, I know like Rural Alive and Well down here, they use the the, um, the fire level warning, you know, oh. the severity of fire risk. They use that as a way to connect with with guys around their well being or where they're at on on the scale for themselves. Um, yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. Um, going with that, 
are there some and what are some other visuals or models that you think worked for you or that you think work with with men in particular particularly in the emergency services space yeah um so i now so as i said i'm now well i don't think i said it, i'm now the program development coordinator for department of police fire emergency management as well as ambulance tasmania uh in and around mental health and well-being so i design uh develop and you know hit the ground running uh actually facilitate yeah um all the workshops for all those agencies um flat out to now that we're on now facilitating on you know recruit courses through to uh you know police inspector courses fire courses recruits through to senior station officer and the equivalent uh and at when they're on board and that type of thing as well visual is so important because it's really hard to, you know, think about text or think about something that I've listened to. Um, so I don't think, for whatever reason, I haven't got one uh, right beside me, but the mental health continuum. So you talked about that fire kind of thing from, you know, green through to red. We use now at work uh, the mental health continuum. So green is where you're positive, you're proactive, you're smiling, through to yellow where, you know, step out of that green into the orange, and then the red is where, you know, I'm unwell. This is where life's, you know, pretty tough. This is where I might be, you know, meeting the, you know, the diagnostic criteria for mental illness, um, you know. And the problem and, and why why we use that mental health continuum is because not just veterans and first responders, but especially blokes, we do nothing when we're in that yellow and orange. We wait till we're in the red. Mm. Uh, before we start doing anything about it. That's our physical health as well, you know, like, yeah, let's wait till we get chest pain before we actually start losing a few kilos, you know. Let's wait until we got type 2 diabetes uh, before we, you know, stop throwing battered hamburgers in our guts. I, I like battered <laughs> hamburgers, but anyway. Um, but anyway, you know, that's that's where, that's but you know, that's where we get to. So with this, I've developed, like, in, and now, again, we, we roll it out, and it's great. I've now been asked to make these big A3 or larger posters and put them in lifts of police stations uh, of that mental health continuum where it's got suggested, their suggested kind of signs, symptoms and behaviours of what green looks like, what yellow looks like, right through to what red, um, just so people can stop and think. And then what we do, what I do ask people to do is actually forget about your yellow and orange and red for a while. Let's just focus in on what your green looks like. When you're smiling, when people want to be around you, when you want to be around them, uh, what does that look like? How often do you go fishing? How often do you walk the dog? How many beers do you have? How many hours sleep do you have a day? You know, um, cigarettes. How often do you go to the gym? What are your reps like? You know, all of that because we don't. We get tapped on the shoulder, you know, when we're in that yellow and orange, and you know, told what we're doing wrong. But it's mm -hmm. just coming back to that. And then, importantly, the next question is then when you step into that yellow and orange. What are your go-to activities? You know, like, ha have you got something? So for me now, is you know, turning a bit of wood. Um, you know, it, for me, you know, it's, you know, definitely, you know, spending time getting out with mates, uh, you know, love fishing. But that it changes from when I go to the yellow through the or to the orange. You know, I don't spend any time really in the red. But when I get to the orange, it'll be actually Alison, my better half. She'll say, Brennan, you got to go. Jump in a swag, you know. Take, go, go bush, jump in the swag. I do that with the kids. And that just brings me straight back to the green. So that's a significant kind of break from mm. uh, routine. Um, but, yeah, it's just finding that thing that you can do when you step into the yellow. But that comes from awareness. We need to get smarter as blokes, but especially first responders and, and veterans. But, it, but so many blokes are just emotionally munted. You know, we've we've got to start recognising the words plus how it actually feels as well. Hmm. That's great. I, I want to shift a moment. You, you mentioned a little bit before about Trojans treks and I had a little look at what they are. I have a question around that, but before we I ask the question, could you just give like a brief context about what that is just so people can know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's, we take... Uh, 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 all genders, uh, but uh, military, uh, police and, and first responders away for uh, five nights uh, out back Queensland, Flinders Ranges, and we've now been approached to run one. Uh, we'll run one in New South Wales out of Wagga as well as the Northern Territory, um, where we take people away and uh, it's 
all the staff a lived experience, um, having lived experience of you know wearing a uniform and uh, and or you know impacted by service. Uh, we don't go right into the kind of mental ill health, but we find that most people uh, have had periods of that as well. Um, and what we talk about first, kind of cab off the rank when we sit people down is we we go to kind of Stephen Covey's uh, book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Circle of concern and circle of influence. Like, let's actually think about, you know, where do we spend all our time? And then the encouragement for the week is to only worry about what we have influence, direct influence over. And people really struggle with what they actually have direct influence over. But that, when you ask that question, the answer is me, mine, I'm, I, or I. You know, my thoughts, my behaviour, my actions, you know, me. Um, so that's the first. Then we talk about identity. We talk about values. What are, what are your values? What's actually important to you? Um, we then talk about the power of curiosity, um, you know, getting curious. You know, we talk about communication, communication styles. You know, a, a lot of us, especially those, again, military and, and first responders, you know, we get really good at that kind of command and control kind of communication style. How many people both, you know, uh, blokes, you know, and and women come and say that their partner and kids, are, you know, keep telling them that they're sick of being treated like a, a recruit or a crook. You know, it's like it doesn't go down well. Um, and what, but again, as much as the content is brilliant, and we've got clinical oversight over that, of what we deliver, because we we obviously don't want to cause any harm. What we find is it's bringing twenty people with that lived experience in. That's the power to it, Bring, getting people away from computers, out in the bush, feet on the ground, you know, and the wind in their hair, sitting around a fire and just sharing life. Uh, we go pretty hard that we're not here to talk about, you know, how you won the war or, you know, how many times you've been shot at or, you know, trauma. We're talking about where you're at now, where you want to be. And it just, it is mind-blowing for people. We've had people military personnel, current serving uh, police and first responders who never thought they'd go back. They've actually haven't told their, you know, employer that they're coming along and then, you know, they go back and then they're heading back to work just with a different mindset. It's really mm -hmm. powerful. It's really powerful. I, I, I imagine like through those treks, like there's lots of time to probably laugh, time to maybe cry, reflect on life, set purpose. But what I'd also imagine there's a lot of time doing is disconnecting from social media. I'm just wondering, have, have you got a sense from running these workshops, the impact, maybe the good and the not so good that social media has on these people, like on their their troubles, so their health and well-being? And is there any long-term stuff that happens from them having that five days moving forward? Yeah, so on on the social media, I mean that is, and it's not just social media either, but it's the phone calls as well. So we we tend to uh, go, we're going to have to go further and further because Telstra are getting better at better putting towers up. Uh, but we try and get away from uh, mobile reception as well, just so that people can concentrate yeah on themselves. Um, but social media, I mean, you know, I, I get I get lost in it. You know, we've got, you know, Dillon Valley community notice board and other you know facebook groups that can turn poisonous really really quick and you know and you can just you just get caught up in the crap like, like it's but you know and and you know again just that the heated fire and the you know the self-righteousness of one individual and then you find all of a sudden you're banging away and having a go at you know someone and we talk about communication on the track where you know there's so much more to communication than just words. Well, we, you know, there's no tone, there's no pitch, there's no, you know, anything on when you're arguing with someone on, on the internet. Um, and again, like taking away from social media, there's so much out there in and around the mental health space now that is confusing for people. Um, so again, with the five days away, what they're getting, you know, there's kind of seven facilitators. Um, what they're getting is seven points of view that are roughly on track, uh, but seven lived experiences, you know, of, of getting through it um, as opposed to just the noise, if that makes sense. Um, and to that second point, so we've actually only just 2024 uh, will be, yeah, the first year where we actually look at post-trek support. Um, and 
what what we've generally done is uh, yeah, LinkedIn link people in with um, you know different organisations who who we know of, uh, depending on yeah where they're at. Uh, but what we've found, we've got a, a fantastic uh, clinical psych now on the board as well, Joe, and um, he's really keen uh, to again have a lived experience, uh, you know, meeting much like much like yours, um, but for people post trek, you know, monthly, uh, just to check in with you know where they're going. I'd like to potentially use something like the I don't know if everyone's heard of it, but the smart recovery model for uh, getting over you know alcohol and substance use where First question, when you come to the next meeting, you know, achieve. Well, let's set some smart goals around it. You know. Just uh, Brendan, I was interested, right? I love, love, love the um, framework that you're approaching, and and of course, you know, completely on board with the power of a, of a lived experience connection. One thing, though, I, I find is we, we tend to make them events, like blokes connect with events. Uh, a bit of a one-off thing or a group or something that's in the schedule, but it's it's not locked in as a practice, as a discipline. And uh, I think from the your background, you would understand the net, the power of practising the, the, the insights that you develop on these weekends. So what do you think we can do overall to increase a level of accountable connection over time so that these skills can be practiced and honed and and uh, emphasized and then bounce it off a wall like I, i'm involved with uh mentoring men and i love that one-on-one -on -one long term engagement uh, what are your thoughts on on that uh, sort of continuous improvement process oh well i mean it has to be you know nobody wins a, a a footy game by only picking up the ball training you know um so we need to get better at it but you know there's so many of us, you know, like there's so many mm. small organisations, yeah, you know, trying mm. trying to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know, you know, whether I'm sure there is, you know, in pockets, you know, a collective, you know, where people get together and, you know, and try not to tread on each other's toes, who's doing what, you know, in the zoo, but then people are then, then all of a sudden a grant comes up and then everybody's, you know, fighting and scrambling over the top of each other. But for the... um. Yeah, for the, for the individual themselves, um, I actually heard it from a, again, it was in a policing context and he was talking about promotion and he said, you know, there's, uh, you know, lots of constables and then there's less sergeants and less inspectors and less commanders. The higher you get up, the lonelier it gets. Um, and I think I put that back to me, you know, like I had a whole lot of mates when I was unwell. You know, I was at the pub at 11, 10.30 in the morning, you know, um, and then as I got better, I had to find another new friendship groups. Uh, um, you know, and but and that was really hard. Uh, so it's for the person themselves, and um, you know, and when you know people leave hospital, or inpatient facilities, or or even outpatient, you know, we've got to set put set people up, uh, you know, and link people in. Yeah. Uh, and again, you know, I, I actually really like uh, the. You know uh, the idea of that the firm handshake, looking someone in the eye and mm. telling them you're going to see them next week. You know mm. that accountability partner. Um, mm. I also like the idea of kind of contracts. You know, like like sitting down and and working out. You know, so that mental health continuum is a a great example of hey, let's two of us do it. Let's catch in. You know, let's uh, you know plan on doing three things out of our green uh, by Thursday, and then catch in catch up on Thursday, and uh, you know, give each other a you know a bit of a kick if we haven't done it. You know, mm -hmm. like, so it, yeah, it's got to happen. Fantastic. Um, one of the sort of purposes of the network is to help inform uh, men who are who who come with lived experience, who've got lived experience of of suicide in some way, and, and want to do something with that, and how they can play a role in the broader community. So I'm just wondering, from that perspective, um, what do you think that we, as lived experience advocates who might be working in, you know, all sorts of different spaces, what do we need to push for when it comes to support for emergency services or veterans? What are the things, you know, we might not be in that space, but what can we advocate for for that section of the community? 
Yeah. Um, actually, if I can pull it back, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that question initially, That's just right. in around people who have a lived experience who want to work kind of in this in this yep. space that, that we're all in. Um, my biggest tip for people is you have to be well, um, you know, and, and be doing it for, uh, you know, the people that you're coming to contact with. As much as, you know, you and I might get, you know, a whole lot out of, you know, running a trek or a mental health first aid, you know, course, or, you know, people focus leadership like I do with the department. I walk out of there buzzing, you know. I, you know, it's great. But I'm not there for me. Um, so I think that we need to be well. Um, and, you know, what we also need to do with the lived experience workforce, and I think this is where, as much as I said, it's great for clinicians to share their lived experience or, or they should be sharing a bit more of themselves. What we also need to ensure is that we have a firm boundary set as well. Um, I think with that lived experience, we can become clouded um, and over empathetic. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the lived experience workforce, if you like, needs to be a professional workforce. So with that, yeah, it comes boundaries. Hmm. Um, but to the, yeah, to your question, um, yeah, the police and, and veteran, there's no wrong, right answer, you know, like there's, there's a whole lot of people, me included, Trojans uh, Trek is the only uh, veteran or first responder uh, organisation that I'm a part of. Um, I worked for Mates for Mates. Uh, I then worked for Open Arms. Um, I, I, it's not for me. Um, it wasn't for me when I, and, and walking into an RSL, is not for me either. Um, so, you know, just sending people there isn't, yeah, isn't good enough. So it's what people are after. Again, back to that, you know, if it's, you know, oh, I just, you know, what I did, you know, back to that kind of purpose and achievement, you know, what could possibly, you know, what can I do? You know, it's, it's reframing it. You know, dads, we talked about dads in distress and and uh, we, we spoke about dads in distress before, I think, um, yeah, on and, you know, what does a person actually need? You know, is it a dad's group? Is it, you know, a woodworking workshop? You know, is it, you know, putting mountain bikes together? Like what makes them tick? You know, so they're so coming back to that kind of values, what are their values? You know, is it you know, what what kept them in the role, uh, you know, for so long? And for, I've asked coppers this so many times, what, why do you do what you do? Not once has anybody ever said the power that I get with the job. Um, what they've said is, you know, unpredictability, um, you know, assisting people, the, uh, you know, assisting people on, on potentially their worst day, doing something good when everything else has gone bad, um, you know, uh, you know, getting curious about people. or And then as people have been in the job for a while, a lot of the time it's mentoring others. Okay, then, then let's do it. Mm. You know, so now let's find you a role where you can, you know, mentor yeah, other people. And that doesn't have to be in the mental health space. What else are they into? Can they pull apart a, you know, a lawn? I wish someone could do it because I can't. I pull apart <laughs> a lawnmower and, you know, put it back together. Then let's get a group of blokes and that's the job. We're not going to talk about mental health. You yeah. know, if people want to have a chat off, off the side, then let's do it. But, you know, finding that type of thing. Yeah, beautiful. It's an interesting thought there, sorry, Brendan, that, that, that you don't think, you know, talking, not talking about mental health, uh, I, I'm completely on board with that. But the idea that in so many ways, right, our, our conversations aren't good enough as men. Mm. You know, so, like, it's one thing, you know, a lot of organize, men's organisations are doing great work on the social side. Yeah. I'm wondering if there isn't room to, you know, grab hold of some of that, you know, momentum you know from crisis or misunderstanding or you know feeling bad and say no we've got to practice doing better you mentioned language and the and the power of language you know we don't have an emotional vocabulary maybe it's time we learned not just glossed over and worried about you know yeah oh uh, absolutely i mean i so um i heard of this thing down here in hobart that started not out my way um psychology in the pub uh you know like yeah. something yeah, something like like that, but again, lived you know lived experience. But talking about you know, I pull out. I uh, don't know if everyone's seen it, but the feelings wheel. Yeah. Uh, every workshop, like doing yeah. that to thirty six year thirty six year veteran coppers and putting yeah. that up on the thing, they just look at me and just it's one I walk out of their life sometimes because I just yeah. have a go. Like, how many of these words do you actually know? But that 
the feedback. Well, they can't really in until they come up with a different word to explain it. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> as opposed to happy, because I always ask people, yeah. you know, I am happy when, and I get, you know, spending time with the kids or kayaking or going for a shot, you know, deer shooting down here, you know, whatever. Okay, let's get smarter about it. As opposed to using the word happy, what is it? Oh, I'm feeling content. I'm feeling at peace. You know, I'm feeling calm. You know, all these type of things. It's been great because happiness is so hard to get. And if and if it's, um, you know, if the only time you find happiness is when you're going for a shot of, to deer, then what do you do the other six months when it's not deer season? But if it's, oh, well, I'm actually, it's when I'm active, or you know, or I'm happy. Oh, it's actually not happiness. It's actually I'm I'm really happy when I'm curious. Great. Then let's find something smaller that we can do in those micro moments the five minutes where we need a break to do that i would love to run those type of relaxed conversations and getting people yeah, there the issue that i think again that we have as folks is we continually rate, rate, wait until we're in the red so we need to normalize it i mean schools are doing better than they ever have uh, but we need to normalize it right through and i think that we do it well in primary school then there is a significant drop off especially or down here we call it matric but all the older ones always call it matric but year 11 and 12 especially for boys and men is where we've got to come back to that what are these words what are these actual feelings you know what does you know and touch on everything what does actually consent look like when you're in a relationship you know what does you know, the power language is pretty big when it when you have an intimate relationship, you know. So, you know, let's let's pick up on someone else's signs, you know, let's of, of what they actually mean when they're saying, you know, when when they're saying words. Do they actually mean that? Or, you know, have they been conjured? Yeah. And is that that's the same for us as well, you know, as opposed, you know, boys, I've got a twelve year old and he's just getting into that grunting stage, you know, where they turn into an alien for a few years. But it's like, no, nah, dude, I need some words off you because I want to get being a dad right and I can't do it with something that sounds like, you know, the freaking hairy six-foot bearded or whatever it is, the <laughs> abominable bloody snowman, you know, just grunts and walks into his room. Like, I need more cover if you want me to do better. And I, we've got to do that with 17, 18-year-olds as well. I've got, I've got one more question for you and then JB will probably have one more. What are the moments in your work, like you do a lot of great work, but what are the moments that truly humble you and you just go, wow, I feel so blessed to do this. Like you, you look at the context of your life and you go, okay, this has led me to be able to do that. What are those moments for you? Uh, yeah, I think it's just when um, when people walk in like to a workshop, you know, and you can just say that they are not into it, you know, like just... They look at me, they just think, nah, you know, what? one, he's never been a copper, he's never been, you know, fiery, that type of thing. And then, you know, an hour in, as opposed to, you know, arms crossed and looking out the window and, you know, they're, they're, they're leaning in, they're engaged and they're, you know, having a laugh and that type of thing. They're those, and actually Julie uh, Spon, who's a psychologist who works for the Department of Police, she calls sparkle moments. I don't know as far <laughs> sparkle moments for myself but they are um i won't give it that yet but um you know so and they're those but what i do acknowledge in every one of those spots is that i would never have been i wouldn't be here if i hadn't gone through all that crap you know if i wasn't you know bleeding you know on the floor you know when i was a solvent i wouldn't be here if you know um if i hadn't have spent that time in ward 17 I wouldn't be here. So it's those kind of sliding door moments. Um, sometimes I wish, you know, I had more money in the bank, you know, the $50 on the nose on, you know, the dogs in freaking Dapto, you know, for however many years I did that, you know, not not great, but it all brought me to this point, you know. Um, but on that as well, so, I mean, some of the feedback, uh, I, I actually got some today from spending some time with firefighters yesterday and, um, you know, one of the key f takeaways that, that somebody actually wrote down and, you know, a firefighter who you wouldn't think, you know, you wouldn't generally think that this would be a takeaway from a workshop, but it was to stop and recognise my prejudice and bias before I have a conversation with someone because that will assist me 
in assisting them with their well-being. Right. You know, I just, like, that for me was like, yeah, job done. Like, yeah. how good's that, you know? Um, but but that's that individual, you know, like that was that was their takeaway, that was their moment, um, and and they should be con- congratulated for being open to it, you know. Mm. Fantastic. So, um, well, we're getting close to the end of our time, but um, maybe just to help wrap us up, what are your? Um, I think we've got a bit of a sense of some of the things that you do for your own self-care but you know maybe a bit more on that but also you know remind us why that is so important from your perspective why is looking after ourselves first important yeah um oh it just is it's it's back to that i I, you know that motivation the carrot and the stick um yeah uh yeah i I don't want to be beaten with a stick again, uh, you know, so I, I want to continue to kind of get better. I never want to go get back to, uh, you know, where I was. Um, I had a period, it was only six weeks ago where I horribly uh, uh, witnessed a, a fatal bike accident. It was a mate who who passed away and I worked on him uh, and then, you know, ambulance and police rocked up who I all knew and that type of thing. And I recognised right there um, that what I needed to do was sig- some significant kind of self-care. Um, so again, yeah, what, what that looked like was calling a couple of workshops off, uh, you know, work was, work was great. Um, and then yeah, going away, I went up, uh, I took the kids away, uh, camping, uh, in the swag, sat around, um, you know, didn't do what I would have done a few years ago. I still bought, you know, a carton of beer, but I, I went away for three nights and I actually surprised myself. I come back with, uh, I think there was about three left. So I still gave it a little bit of a nudge, but you know, um, but that I'm a prolific reader. Um, that's my go-to. And I've now just starting to get into kind of, I've never been into them before, but audio books. Um, but what I have, and again, it was uh, a great psych in Launceston in Tasmania, Charles, who um, also encouraged me to get away from kind of work, those, you know, self-help or, or textbooks and psych textbooks and, and just, you know, listen to some fiction again. Um I do that, uh, and obviously, yeah, twelve-year-old boy who's all heart, um, all heart and grunts, and a, and a daughter with a backbone of steel with not as much common sense as a mother. Um, just watching her laugh and all that type of thing. They're my go-to, um, but I know that I have to stay well, um, you know, psych-wise because of the work that I do, mm-hmm. um, and I do still have that default where I get concerned with the crap. Um, and I just, again, I picture a circle inside of another circle and go, where am I spending my time? I'm spending my time in that circle of concern, but I have no influence over. Let's step back in. Yeah, fantastic. I, I really want to pick out um, a thing there, you know, getting away, getting in your own space, getting into nature, whatever that might be for various people. But you you actually still um, were taking you know, there's the the other responsibilities you've got as a dad and member of the family, you can still take some of that away with you, you know, take the kids, that's maybe yeah. part of the distraction, but it, it's, you know, sometimes I, I think for me, I think I've got to get myself away, yeah, my own space, but actually maybe that's not always right. Maybe there are, you know, there's a, a yeah. bit of, there's a, lots more options than that. Yeah, and, but it's horses for courses, you know. Like I am a, I am a social, you know, social kind of beast, you know. Like I, I mean, I again, uh, you know, bit of a bit of a weirdo. Like I, I'll, I, I buy a book and then go to the busiest pub in Hobart, uh, you know, or Launceston or wherever I'm at, and or on you know the Melbourne, the Boxing Day Test. I will take a book and sit in the busiest pub in Melbourne and read a book. I don't know why. I just do it. Um, it works for me. Uh, but just on that as well the, the biggest thing that we have to do as well self care self care wise is communicate with our loved ones as well so i did that with my kids as well um you know in advance like we, we were packing the ute to go away and i said listen i want to do this you know i don't want to have a go at you like oh, I'm, i was brought up by a copper and i was in the army i like stuff done my way um you know and i'm really conscious of you know not not kind of barking at them and i i 
so I had that chat with him, mate. I'm I'm stressed. Like I'm, I'm up here. I'm taking his away because I need some downtime. Um, you know, so I need I need you to give me a hand. You know, like just if I ask you to do something, you know, please do it. If you can't do it, then be quick and just let me know you, you can't do it, because uh, then I I won't be wondering. Um, and when I got in the car, when we got in the Ute and we took off the driveway, I said, "How'd I go? Did I have a go at you? Was there was there any bad words? I thought I did really well." And my son went, "Yeah, no, you went all right." So what do you mean, all right? He said, oh, I still got that disappointed dad look a couple of times. <laughs> oh, you know. So if that's the worst now. So, yeah, that's pretty good. That's well, pretty Brandon, good. I really just want to acknowledge you and thank you for the conversation tonight and joining us and the depth of your, your lived experience to take that and put it towards working with other people and, and that passion that you have to help people be well, lead well lives and, and really empowered to move forward. It's really a beautiful thing that you do. And I, I love that you, you've also continued to become informed about how to do things better. And yeah, you, you seem to be a person who's continually learning, but yeah, it's been brilliant having you on here. And yeah, I'm sure that your conversation, your words are going to impact many people. So yeah, thank you so much for, for your time tonight. It's been a pleasure. Well, mate, no, thank you. I, you know, I've just spoke about myself for an hour. So what's not to like? <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Should we uh, no, right. appreciate the invite? Stop on the old recording.